They call me Mad Jack. And if there's anybody in these mountains that knows the real story of James Adams, that'd be me. So I'm putting it down in writing just the way it happened in hopes of setting the record straight. Now, my friend Adams was accused of a crime he didn't commit. So he escaped into the mountains, leaving behind the only life that he ever knew. Now, that wilderness out there ain't no place for a greenhorn, and his chances of surviving were mighty slim. Were no time at all for he was beaten down, ragged, and nearly stalked. Long about then, he come upon a grizzly bear cub, all alone and helpless. Now, Adams knew that little critter couldn't survive without his help, so he started right down that cliff, risking his own life to save it. <laughs> now that cub took to Adams right off. And that was when he discovered he had a special kind of way with animals. They just come right up to him like he was a natural part of the wilderness. But that bear cub, he was extra special. As he growed, he became the best friend Adams ever had, and together they became a legend. Hey, there's a world where we don't have to run. The fine thing about the wilderness, it don't belong to no one in particular. All that space you see between here and yonder is just as wild and free as the day God built it. In a place as untamed as this, you're likely to meet up with all kinds of critters running loose. Some got fur, some got feathers, some got hooves, and some got claws. Some got four legs, and once in a great while, if you're looking real close, you might even see one with two legs. On this here day, it was young Robbie Cartman skedaddling up the valley toward Grizzly Adams' place. Robbie lived over the other side of the ridge with his father, and he had some crazy notion that he wanted to grow up to be a mountain man. Adams promised the boy that he would teach him all about surviving in the wilds and the two of them had become the best of friends. Ben, what are you up to now? Man, will you let Nocho out? You know, you're worse than an old mother hen. Well, come on, little fella. We can't leave you behind. Come on. You're gonna have to excuse Ben. He's just fretting that you were gonna get yourself hurt, was all. Yeah, I reckon he figured you weren't so likely to get yourself in trouble locked up in the cabin. He just don't remember what it's like being a frisky little cow. Where's your pa? Pa had to go to town for some supplies. Since it's such a long trip, he said I could come and stay with Ben and you. You telling me you hiked all the way here from your cabin by yourself? No, sir. Pa brought me as far as the ridge. We saw your smoke, so he said I could come the rest of the way all by myself. But I could have made it the whole way by myself. I'm getting to be a real mountain man. Well, so you are. <laughs> Where'd you get that cub? Oh, he's a stray. He came up on the door a few days back. Guess he smelled that fish cooking and thought he was going to make himself a new home. Are you going to keep him? Well, 
Wouldn't be right not to try and find his mom. She's probably worried sick about him. Where is we were just setting off to find her. Can I come too? Well, I guess we couldn't very well leave you behind now, can we? No, sir. Well, come on. We'll fix you a pack. We've got a long way to go. Uh, gee, thanks, Mr. Adams. Come on, Nochus. Come on. Let's go. Hurry up, Nochus. Don't you want to find your mother? She's probably right around here somewhere. Mr. Adams, where do we look first? We'll let Ben figure that out. I'm sure he's got a few ideas where to find her. Where's he going? Well, I reckon he just caught scent of something. Probably a honey tree. He'll be back all covered with honey and at least a couple dozen bee stings on his nose. Mr. Adams? find that little cub's maw. Well, it ain't gonna be easy. This is mighty big territory. Sure is. Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams, look. What is it? A smoke signal. Reckon it's trouble? No. That's just my brother saying howdy. Your brother? He never told me he had a brother. Why does he stay hid so much? Well, I expect that's just his way. I'll tell you what we'll do. You go get some wood, we'll light a fire, and we'll say howdy back to him. All right. Get some nice dry branches. What's his name? Well, you know Nakoma. Nakoma? Nakoma's your brother? Well, he's, he's like one. He's my blood brother. Blood brother? What's that mean, Mr. Adams? Well, that means like we're two living things that feel as one. We aren't actually brothers of the flesh, but brothers in spirit. Well, it was pretty clear that Robbie didn't quite understand what Adams was trying to say. I guess I'm going to have to start from the beginning. When I first came to the wilderness, I was as green as spring grass. Ah, oh, come on, Mr. Adams. Not you. It's true. I didn't know the first thing about surviving in the wilds. And if it hadn't have been for Ben and the other animals and the coma, well, I don't think I'd be here talking with you today. When I saw that big old trout swimming lazy in the water, I figured my supper was a cinch. Just watching that trout swim away told me how little I knew about providing for myself. And for the first time, I realized that I could die out here and nobody would even know or care. Boy, I would have been scared. Well, I was scared and feeling mighty alone. Most of the time, I, I didn't know what to expect. It seemed peaceful enough out in the wilderness, but danger was always on my mind. Then I got kind of a surprise. Hey, little fella. Like a biscuit? Well, it was the darndest thing I ever saw. That doe just came walking up to me like she'd known me all her life. Well, all of a sudden, I realized that the wilderness was full of living things, and I wasn't alone at all. Everywhere I went, I started noticing just how many friends I really did have out there. There were furry critters, and well, there were some that most men would have shied away from. But I seemed to get along with all of them. Well, we just kind of shared the forest. I didn't understand it myself. It was though those animals knew I was a friend and meant them no harm. And I started feeling like I was part of the wilderness. Then one day, I came upon a bear cub and got himself into a real fix. The cub was mighty weak and hungry. 
and I didn't get to him none too soon. I started nursing him back to health with a diet of sweet water and honeycomb. Now, that cub had a born instinct for surviving. No cub. Those berries are no good. I ate them. They'll make you sick. All right. Don't say I didn't try and warn you. But he seemed to know what he was doing. And after all, he'd been out in the wilds longer than me. And that's how I learned the difference between Saskatoons and corn lilies. Well, I decided to call that cub Ben, after Benjamin Franklin, the smartest man I ever heard tell of. Seemed fitting, since that cub was the smartest bear I ever met. By following that bear around, I learned about all sorts of foods. There was wild duck, pea vine, Indian turnips, onions. I found out that a human could eat almost anything a bear does. Well, I knew that cub couldn't go chasing after me all through the mountains. So I decided to build a little camp. Figured we'd stay put for a while, at least till I could figure out what to do next. While I was busy building my lean-to, Ben was out getting acquainted with the neighbors. But I think Ben's curiosity started getting him in over his head. So I decided to keep a leash on him so he wouldn't go running off and getting into trouble. Ben's antisocial behavior started getting him in over his head. neck of the woods running for cover every time they see you. I want you to make friends with them. This here's Martha Washington. I want you to say howdy. Well, say howdy. Look how nervous you got her. All right, Miss Washington. There you go. Now, that's more like it. By this time, Ben and me was getting to be like family to each other. He come to depend on me, and I can't deny I enjoyed his company. So we just settled down to make a nice, peaceful lives for ourselves. It's so quiet out in the wilderness. Comes a time you start hearing every sound there is. Well, I knew I heard something up in those rocks, but I didn't have any idea what it could be. I figured whatever it was, as long as it didn't bother me, I wouldn't bother it.
He had taken a long, hard fall. And to tell you the truth, I didn't expect to find him still breathing. The Indian's leg was broken. And I knew I had to set the bone back in place, but I couldn't do it there. I had to get him back to my camp. I built a travois to carry the Indian. Being unconscious, the rough traveling didn't seem to bother him. Well, that night, I set his leg in a splint. He seemed to be breathing more regularly. Didn't seem to be getting any worse. I felt so helpless. I didn't know what else to do for the Indian. I didn't know if he was going to live or die. All I could do was try and make him comfortable and wait till his fever broke. trying to help you. Now simmer down. That was crazy. It hurt that leg of yours really bad. All that struggling of his has knocked him out again. So I had to pull him back into the lean-to. I don't mind telling you. From then on, I slept with one eye open. Of course, he slept with both eyes closed. I think I got it set good, though. I had to take your knife last night. You were out of your head, and I thought you might hurt somebody. Mainly me. I'll give it back to you, though, when you're well enough to leave. You better eat that. It don't taste like much, but it'll fill you up. Even though my words didn't have no meaning to him, I felt that he understood that he could trust me. So I just went about my life in the forest and let him in. Hi there, little fella. You been having a busy day? <laughs> Some of this? Don't be greedy. Well, I reckon I was about the first white man that Indian had ever seen. And I must have looked like a mighty peculiar sight. A man running through the wilds with the bear cub tagging along, talking to animals like it was humans. 
If he could have, he'd have got up and ran as far from me as he could get. But that leg of his wasn't about to take him nowhere. Let's see how that leg's doing. The Indian mended slowly, and I knew it was going to take more than hardtack and water to get him on his feet again. So I set out to see if I could catch him a fish. Trying to grab one of them slippery fellas was like not trying to latch on to lightning. Well, this is something I hadn't counted on. If I could sweet talk that cat out of his supper, it would do that Indian a lot more good than me maybe catching a fish. Morning, cat. See, so you got yourself some fresh food. Suppose I could talk you out of some of it? It's not for me, mind you. It's for a sick friend. Don't get me wrong. I know you're a family man. You got youngins to feed. But if I could just have half, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't need it. Pay you back sometime, I promise. Ben, supper's ready. Uh... Here, you can use this, it's good for you. You know what the good book says? It says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Do you know what that means? It means you're going to die if you ain't willing to take help from them and are willing to give it. Now take this food and eat it. Yeah. You know, I think I missed my call. I should have been a preacher. Ben? Uh, uh, yeah. When a storm starts kicking up out in the wilderness, you can expect it's going to be a real humdinger. Let's get home, Ben. Ooh. This has turned into a real gully, won't it? Nice cozy fire feels good right about now. I saw a man start a fire with a spark once. You see, he wasn't no smarter than me. Valley was running over. Ben just loved it. He got right in there and had himself a time. The weather, it was dry. 
The sun's so hot, I froze to death. Susanna, don't you cry. Cause I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. I guess some folks just don't appreciate good music. Well, I had a dream the other night when everything was still. I thought I saw Susanna, dear, coming down the hill. could trust him now. And that night, I was able to sleep with both eyes closed. It's a crutch. Crutch. Use it like this. I don't think you're getting my meaning. Takes the place of your bad leg. Try it. Yeah. Good. told me his name was Nakoma. Nakoma taught me how to make my lean-to watertight and how to make hide patches when my britches gave out. We built a smoke teepee, and he showed me the right hardwoods to use to smoke jerky. He showed me how to make my way through the forest, using the sun and the stars and even tree moss as guides. Nakoma taught me weather signs, tree signs and animal tracks, and even how to catch fish without a hook. He even showed me how to take the seeds from a pine cone and plant a new pine tree. There didn't seem to be anything about living in the wilderness that Nakoma didn't know. impressed the way Nakoma threw that axe. I figured I might as well give it a try. I could stick a knife. Axe couldn't be that much different. in that tree, it was easy for Nakoma. But I could see I was going to have to come up with my own style. Spider. But gee, mm -mm. like this. Ben was starting to get bigger. 
but he sure wasn't getting any more sense. He had a habit for picking friends that always had little surprises in store. Coma claimed his soup would cure anything from warts to baldness. If it didn't kill you first. But I guess Nakoma's soup worked, because he started healing real fast after that, and it wasn't long before he was taking off his splint. Though. Just better take it easy on that leg for a while. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm going to hate to hurt you now. All right. But don't say I didn't try and warn you. What's this? Some sort of an Indian dance? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, I got it. You're starting to feel your oats. Why don't you come back when you're growing some? Well, I outweighed Nakoma a good 40 pounds and stood a hand or two taller. So I decided to take it easy on him. Did your mom ever tell you to pick on somebody your own size? Pronto! All right, it's your funeral. Yeah. I wasn't exactly sure who Ben was rooting for, but I think he was enjoying it. I finally got it pounded into my head that there was more than the coma that met the eye. And if I was going to come out of this with any dignity left at all, I was going to have to use some tricks I'd learned from other men I'd fought along the way. I suspect that's when the Coma and me started being real friends. My first summer in the wilderness had passed quickly. It had been a time for learning and a time for friendship, a time for becoming one with nature. But just as the seasons change, so must our lives. There was something on Nakoma's mind. I didn't know what, but he seemed restless, as though time was calling him to other things.
Comas seem to be involved in some sort of an Indian ritual. When the coma motioned me to the fire, I was a bit reluctant at first, but my curiosity got the best of me. I didn't know what he had in mind with that knife, but by now I'd learned to trust him. that Nakomo was performing a ceremony that would make us spiritual brothers, brothers in blood. We let our blood mingle together, and I could feel a bond grow between us. brothers now, but I did not then understand its true meaning. Deal with garlic, you got. Goodbye, Nakoma. Nakoma returned to his people. As I watched him vanish back into the woods like a wild spirit, I thought I'd never see him again. And the loneliness I felt when I first came to the wilderness suddenly came crashing back on me. As time passed, I grew to know the mountains like they were a close friend. With Nakoma gone, life just didn't seem worth living no more. But Ben reminded me I was a part of something now. I had more friends in the woods than I could put a number on, and that had to count as something. For the next few years, we just wandered mostly, never staying long in one place. The seasons came and went without my bothering to keep track of them. Come on, Ben. You're big enough to keep up with me now. Quit your fooling around. Ben grew into a fine-looking big grizzly, and I began to know the wilderness as well as most folks know their own backyard. feeling as though something was following Ben and me, watching us, keeping a track over our every move. I hoped it was just in my head, but it was a strange kind of feeling, and I couldn't shake it. Ben and me found a place to our liking, so we decided to put down roots and stay a while. I guess I didn't realize the tree was ready to fall and I was standing in its way. Uh, uh, 
I was pinned good. The pain of my leg was almost more than I could stand. I knew I had to get free soon, because the blood was being cut off in my leg. Lift it, Ben. Ah! You can't roll it. Lift it. Pick it up, Ben. It was Nakoma's presence I felt all this time. Now I knew that my blood brother had been watching, keeping a protective eye open, always alert to any danger that might come to me. Well, now that Nakoma had saved my life, I thought he'd leave for good. But he didn't. I guess he never will. Because you see, Robbie, a blood brother's for life. And even beyond. Wish I had a blood brother. This is Ben. Did you find that honey tree, Ben? He brought somebody with him. It's the cub's mother. Where'd you find her, Ben? did for that cub, Ben. He'd be a lot better off being raised by his proper family. Now, aren't they? Well, I never thought about it. But they could be. Years from now, they'll remember this day, and when one of them gets in trouble, the other one will come to help. Just like real brothers. Yeah, it could happen. Well, Ben and Nochos are blood brothers, and you and Nicole are blood brothers. I'm the only one that doesn't have a blood brother. Now, just be patient, Robbie. When it's time for you to have a blood brother, you'll know it. Well, we got a long way to go, so we better get headed back if we're gonna get home before dark. All right, Mr. Adams. Shorachi, mm. Kajuga. Mm. How do you call that? Greetings, my brother. To Shoda. I am well. Oh! Ichi Nagasha. Golly, Mr. Adams, who's that? That's Nakoma's nephew, Ichi Nagasha. Howdy. I'm Robbie Cartland. Let's walk back to camp together. <laughs> Deep inside the forest is a door into another land. Here is our life and home. We are staying here forever in the beauty of this place all alone. We keep on hoping, maybe. Time will call our 